My name is Brett Gidney. I'm a clinical cardiac electrophysiologist. As a clinical cardiac electrophysiologist, I specialize in taking care of heart rhythm problems. So I'm a cardiologist, but the only thing I focus on are um, diseases related to the heart rhythm. And heart rhythm is very important because usually we think about the heart as an organ that has to squeeze to push blood where it needs to go, but the heart doesn't know to squeeze or how to squeeze without an electrical impulse getting to the right part of the muscle at the right time, and that's the heart rhythm. So if the heart rhythm's wrong, the heart can't beat at all, or it beats incorrectly. When the heart beats incorrectly, we usually divide that up into two problems, either upper chamber problems or atrial problems, or lower chamber problems or ventricular problems. So when the lower chamber doesn't beat properly, that usually means that blood doesn't flow at all, and that means that we pass out. And sometimes, if we're in a rhythm called ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, we could pass out and potentially not wake up. That's called sudden cardiac death. That rhythm, ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, is the kind of rhythm that people pass out from, and someone has to call paramedics, and we see paramedics shock someone's heart back to normal rhythm to reset that lower chamber rhythm so their heart can pump again. Upper chamber rhythm problems are often more subtle than that. So when there's an upper chamber rhythm problem, sometimes patients have palpitations. Sometimes they don't notice anything wrong with their heart specifically, but they notice that they're tired, they're feeling like they don't have the same level of energy they used to, and they may not know to tell their doctor to look into a heart problem, but an EKG or one of the new Apple watches or some of the newer devices like cardio devices where you put your thumbs on it to check the heart rhythm would then tell the patient that their heart is in an abnormal rhythm like atrial fibrillation. And that's very important because not only can it make you feel tired, but upper chamber rhythm problems can also cause strokes. And we always want to prevent a stroke if we can and upper chamber rhythm problems are one of the few sources of stroke that we can figure out in advance and put people on the right medications for so they don't have a stroke in the first place. Upper chamber rhythm problems are relatively um, straightforward to fix and we have a lot of options. Some people choose to remain in the abnormal rhythm forever. We call that permanent atrial fibrillation and we just use some medications to do our best to cover up the problem and uh, not have to reset the rhythm back to normal. Sometimes that's associated with a lot of symptoms that when patients still feel poorly and we decide we actually need to fix the source of the rhythm problem itself rather than just try to cover it up and we call that rhythm control. And when we opt for rhythm control, there are medications called antiarrhythmic drugs and these drugs can help make the abnormal rhythm shorter in duration each time it happens or the episodes are fewer and further between. Sometimes these have side effects though, so we can't always opt only for medications. Fortunately, the main thing that I do is to actually put a catheter into the heart, find the source of the abnormal rhythm, and get rid of it with something called ablation. There's a lot of ways to do an ablation, and we can do that with cold energy or with hot energy radiofrequency ablation, but either way, the goal is to actually find the source of the rhythm problem and permanently get rid of it so we cure someone of their abnormal rhythm problem and make it so they actually need less medications and uh, feel better without quite as many medications. Sometimes the heart rate can be too low and when the heart rate's very low, we can put a pacemaker in and a pacemaker makes it so we can set the lowest rate that the heart is allowed to go and if the heart tries to go under that rate the pacemaker will emit a tiny little electrical impulse through a wire that's attached to the heart and it will not let the heart go that low 
Historically, we would have to put these pacemakers in with a relatively minor surgery with about an inch and a half or two inch long incision under the clavicle, where we would then put this little battery pack called the pacemaker generator or pulse generator and attach a wire to it that then goes through a vein there and into the heart. Now we actually have leadless pacemakers, so transcatheter leadless pacemakers or micro devices as the brand name Medtronic is, um, allow us to put a pacemaker through a catheter and it's a small self-contained pacemaker that gets inserted into the heart and has no wires attached to it at all and it can last 10 to 12 years. So it doesn't require any incision, it doesn't require any stitches, no one would look at a patient and even know it was there but it's something you would see on an x-ray and we can check it wirelessly and will actually transmit information to us from the patient's home so we can see what their heart's up to and make sure that it continues to function normally. When someone has an abnormal rhythm in the lower chamber and that potentially could lead to a risk for sudden cardiac death where they pass out and wouldn't wake up, we actually can make it so that instead of having to get someone to call paramedics and have them come and shock the heart, we can actually install a special type of pacemaker called a defibrillator that will watch the heart. And if the heart ever does something silly, like tries to stop beating, this device will charge up and deliver a shock instantly, take the place of the need to uh, have paramedics come and do that, and it can save someone's life. Um, and they're also relatively easy to put in with a short hour long or 45 minute long procedure. Thank you.